Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program where we study the words of the Buddha in this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, Volume 1. Today we're starting with Chapter 1. We restarted the group learning program about four weeks ago, and we've been doing an overview of the Eightfold Path and diving into the four stages of enlightenment, including the Ten Fetters. Those four classes would help a student to really see an overview of the path to enlightenment, and we got pretty in-depth with it as we were going through those classes. But now, we're actually going to be starting with chapter one and moving through the book every Sunday, chapter by chapter. There's 24 chapters and some additional material at the end, so it's going to take us about six months to gradually go through this book. And that's the way that you would like to actually learn the teachings of the Buddha not having any belief, but instead gradually moving through the resources and just trickling the teachings into the mind slowly but surely over a consistent long-term period of time. So what I suggest people do is read this book about 10 or 15 minutes a day and gradually move the teachings into the mind so that you can not only learn them, but reflect on them to independently verify the truth for yourself and then actually practice them. Whereas if you just blew through the book in a few days or a week or two, you wouldn't be able to retain the understanding and the wisdom that's really there to help you to develop your life practice. Some people will do that though. They will go through the book once and then they'll kind of start over and not only read the book, but also go through these classes so that you can gain some insight and ask questions, getting clarity on the teachings. So I'd like to welcome all of you, whether this is your first time in class with us or you've been in class with us before, because we're going to be starting going through chapter by chapter each Sunday. And this Wednesday, we're going to be starting our four-part series on loving kindness meditation. We've already done a four-part series on breathing mindfulness meditation, and students are encouraged to build up their meditation practice to two to three sessions per day of 30 minutes or more. And that's gonna take time to build up. Some people start with just one session a day for five or 10 minutes, and then they gradually increase it from there. But in order to get to enlightenment and start seeing some real significant results, you're gonna need to get to two to three meditation sessions 30 minutes or more. That's where you see the real significant benefits in the condition of the mind, along with practicing all the other steps of the Eightfold Path. This chapter, chapter one in the book, is right after the preface. And if you haven't read the preface yet, it's really important that you go back and read that because there's some introductory information that's really going to help you get a perspective of how to progress through this book and how to progress through this program and ultimately how to develop your practice towards the attainment of enlightenment. This chapter, chapter one, is really meant to be a bridge because I understood in sharing these teachings with students that the vast majority of the students who are going to be studying with me are going to be coming from other traditions. They're going to be coming from maybe Christianity or Hinduism or Muslim teachings or some other practices that are out there. And what I decided to do is write this chapter as a way to help you bridge over to the Buddhist teachings. Because oftentimes we grow up with certain teachings in our life and we're taught that if we ever go to anything else, that these you know horrible bad things are going to happen to us if we ever look in any direction of any other teachings. But what I aim to do in this particular chapter is to help you see that all the original teachers, whether it's the Buddha, Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, whether you learned Hindu teachings growing up, Judaism, or any other teachings that are out there, all these different teachings are really pointing to three universal teachings. And I describe those as universal love of all beings, 
do no harm, and be a good moral person. And this chapter is titled Universal Teachings, Love, No Harm, Good Morals. And as you read this, hopefully what it does for you is helps you to understand that if you learn the teachings of Jesus Christ or Prophet Muhammad or Hindu teachings or Judaism or any other teachings that are out there, they're really pointing to these same three universal teachings, essentially helping you to learn how to be a better human being and practice in the world in such a way that you can have this universal love for all beings, that you're not harming other beings, and you have actually good morals. Now, depending on how you've learned and what you've learned from the various teachers and the various teachings that exist in the world, you may or may not have studied the Buddhist teachings before. The Buddhist teachings are there in a way that I think are very similar to if you were going to be studying in a university or with a professor. Whereas if you were going to a university and you were going to be studying the topic of marketing, for example, you might learn from Professor A, Professor B, Professor C, and Professor D. And I might do the same thing. And for me, it's Professor A that really connects with me and explains things in a way about marketing that I truly deeply understand. And I'm able to implement that into my professional career and gain some real benefit and value from Professor A. But Professor B and Professor C and Professor D also contributed something to my understanding of marketing, but it was really Professor A for me that really spoke very clearly and helped me to understand the teachings of marketing very clearly. And each individual person, as they study with these various professors, are going to decide that certain professor is really hitting the mark for them and really helping them to understand a topic like marketing. Well, these teachings that we're discussing that the Buddha shared, in my view, is the same way. For some people, they are going to feel that Professor A, maybe Gautama Buddha, speaks very clearly. He had 45 years to teach. He was able to help many people get to enlightenment. And by the time of his death, there was many people that understood his teachings. So therefore, today in the world, you might feel that his teachings are very clear and able to really penetrate and help you to deeply understand this world and this life and how to function as this better human being. He had 45 years to explain it, and his teachings aren't based on belief. They're teachings that you can independently verify and you understand that you are moving towards this goal of enlightenment because you can observe that the discontentedness in the mind is gradually diminishing as you progress on the path. Where some other teachers may be sharing teachings based on belief, you're not necessarily sure whether you're on the right path or whether you're learning the right things or not, and you're conducting yourself in the world in a beneficial way. So for me, it's Professor A, Gautama Buddha, a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha that really knocks the ball out of the park and really explains things in a very detailed way. But I share that with the understanding that people like Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad and others shared teachings that were absolutely beneficial for the world. And rather than sit back and talk about all the differences of how these different teachers are speaking in different ways, saying different things, and perhaps people might argue and fight over who's right and who's wrong. What I prefer to do, and what I think is more beneficial for everyone involved, is to look at how these individual teachers are actually teaching the same things. So that way, as you move from maybe some teachings that you learned in Christianity or Islam teachings or Hindu teachings or what have you, you don't feel that you're necessarily turning your back on any of these other teachings, but instead it's those teachings that led you to where you are today to the point where you're now interested in learning about Buddhist teachings. And the interesting thing is that other people have done this exact same thing, whether it's Christian priests or Christian ministers or other people who are in Judaism and people who are into Muslim teachings. There's a certain collection of people in these various communities that have looked at the Buddhist teachings and learned the Buddhist teachings and incorporate them into their current practices and have realized that they're actually highly beneficial for them. I feel that if you're going to 
learn one particular set of teachings like the Buddhist teachings, you should just stick with the Buddhist teachings and really get really deep into those and see the progress. Or if you're going to study Christian teachings is to really get deep into those and get to the ultimate goal of Christian teachings or Muslim teachings or teachings from Hinduism or Judaism or any of these others. I'm not one who encourages the mixing and matching of teachings, but instead this bridge that I was interested in helping people to understand here in chapter one is to help you understand that you're not turning your back on things that you've learned in the past. Even teachings from grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad help to lead you to where you are today in your life about certain things that you understand that would be wise decisions and how to make wise decisions in the world. But it's this fully perfectly enlightened Buddha who cleared out all the pollution of his mind, spoke about these teachings for 45 years up until he was 80 and actually died, that countless people were able to attain enlightenment through independently verifying the truth and seeing the discontentedness in their mind gradually diminish. And being a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha, he did all that work on his own mind first, so he understood the teachings of what it took to improve the condition of his student's mind because he did the work for himself first. And because he was a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha and he had extinguished all his unwholesome gamma, he didn't die prematurely like what we see with Jesus Christ. He actually died early in life based on decisions that he made that he was actually murdered after one to three years of teaching. He was crucified and the people that were left behind didn't necessarily understand his teachings in the way that he did. And we also know that Jesus Christ wasn't fully perfectly enlightened. This is why he said, I will come again, which is rebirth. He needed to be reborn in order to come back and share deeper teachings that would help people get to this better way of life. And during his lifetime, we also know that he tossed tables over in the temple when he saw vendors selling things in the temple. He didn't like that, and he got angry. He tipped tables over and knocked tables over. An enlightened being isn't going to have anger. So while Jesus delivered some helpful and beneficial teachings to the world, he met his objective that he shared and delivered teachings that ultimately helped people to understand that there's only one God. Because prior to Jesus Christ, especially during Gautama Buddha's lifetime, people believed in multiple gods, that there were multiple gods. But the Buddha did something very wise is that he didn't make God a central figure in his teachings because it's not God who determines whether you attain enlightenment or not. It's your decisions that determine that. So while Gautama Buddha discussed these different gods that people believed in during his lifetime, he didn't make God a central role in his teachings because he didn't have any information that could prove God's existence or disprove God's existence. Oftentimes people say that Gautama Buddha denied the existence of God, which actually isn't true. Gautama Buddha taught about these different gods, but essentially discussed them as another being in the cycle of rebirth. And now as a being, a human being, it's up to you to learn and practice so that you can see the truth for yourself and train the mind, eliminating pollution, getting to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy that we call enlightenment. And Jesus Christ might have called that the Holy Spirit using different language. Oftentimes you can look at the Buddhist teachings and other people's teachings and see these similarities where Jesus Christ said, love thy neighbor, the Buddha would have said, have loving kindness and compassion for all beings. Where Jesus Christ would have said, you reap what you sow, the Buddha would have talked about the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect. And Jesus and the Buddha both talked about rebirth because Jesus Christ said, I will be reborn, essentially. He said, I will come again. And you can see these similarities throughout these different teachings, even Prophet Muhammad, there's a part that I know about his teachings where he taught generosity and having a well-developed practice of generosity in your community. And also you can see in the Muslim teachings that there's a certain amount of self-discipline and this ability to actually pray five times a day. That requires an enormous amount of self-discipline in order to build up your practice to pray five times a day which is needed in terms of the self-discipline in order to get to enlightenment, not necessarily the prayer, but 
this self-discipline is really required and this generosity is required in order to get to enlightenment. So the more that you understand all these various teachings in the world, not that you need to do that, but if you have that understanding and you start to learn about the Buddhist teachings, what you'll see is that the Buddhist teachings are very clear, very direct, very to the point. And because they're not based in belief, you can actually see the improvement to the condition of the mind as you progress forward on this path to enlightenment. And all these various teachers are really pointing to the same thing, which is helping us to become a better human being. And my suggestion and encouragement to students is to find a professor that speaks very clearly to you and that you can understand their teachings very deeply and stick with that professor because that's where you're going to be able to then get very deep into the teachings and see the progress. When we mix and match these things together, that's where it becomes very difficult for the mind to be able to understand. And this is where some people might argue and fight over who's right and who's wrong. And rather than argue at all, or rather than to say who's right or who's wrong, my approach is to just say everybody was right. Everybody was sharing essentially teachings that are leading humanity to a better way of life. And if we see these things as isolated things of Buddhism, Christianity, Muslim teachings, Hindu, Judaism, if we see them as isolated stoved pipe things, then we miss the ability to see the commonality in all these things and that humanity needs to gradually evolve to this higher consciousness that our species needs to gradually evolve. And that's what we've been doing all the way back from the beginning of humanity. When we first started, humans walked around naked and we were dirty and we didn't know how to care for the physical body. We didn't know how to really get food. We didn't know how to start fires. We didn't know how to hunt. We didn't know how to do a lot of things. But gradually over countless years, we've been evolving as human beings, gaining more and more intelligence about the world around us and getting to the point where now we have these education systems, we have food systems, we have transportation systems, we have medical care, all these other things that are helping to support our existence in the world. And one of the things that we've also been evolving with is these universal teachings and these teachings of how to become better human beings. And to me, it's the Buddha who really speaks very clearly. And you can see the truth for yourself as the mind is gradually improving, that the mind is eliminating discontentedness, that it's not believe, 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 believe. And then when you die, you hope you kind of figured things out. But instead, because there's this aspect of learning, this reflection where you can independently verify his teachings, and then there's this practice that you develop to improve the condition of the mind, and then you can observe the results of that. Gautama Buddha speaks very clearly to me, but these other professors surely contributed something to the world that helps us. For example, one of the main goals of Jesus Christ was to convince the world that there was just one God. And up until his lifetime, people believed that there was multiple gods gods. And nowadays, there's still people who believe there's multiple gods in the world. But those people are a lot fewer than those who, if they understand God, they feel that there's only one God. And God isn't a central role in the path to enlightenment. But I'm just using this as an example to help you see that each one of these teachers were working towards certain goals. The Buddha's goal was to deliver these teachings that liberate the mind without them being connected or attached to anything else like God or anything else. It's all about your decisions. Your decisions is what's going to lead to your enlightenment. Where when Jesus came along, his objective was to help people to see that there's only one God and he needed to perform a lot of miracles in order to convince people who he was. And then when he said there's only one God, people essentially believed that and if they had their own personal evidence of the existence of God, then they understood that to be true themselves. And then Prophet Muhammad, I'm not too clear on his teachings. I haven't really learned much of them. But from what I have seen, there's definitely some degree of awakening that Prophet Muhammad had to be able to deliver the type of teachings that he did, which ultimately have helped a lot of people in the world based on improving their life. And all of these teachers are sharing something unique with us and speaking in their own way. 
I call what's happening in this world the natural laws of existence, that there's all these natural laws that the unenlightened mind is unaware of. There's this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality. And Gautama Buddha is explaining these natural laws through his teachings. His words, his teachings are helping a practitioner to understand these natural laws. Well, Jesus and Prophet Muhammad and others tapped into these natural laws as well, and they explained them in their own language, in their own words. Again, the Buddha had much longer time, 45 years. And being a fully, perfectly enlightened Buddha, his mind was very clear. He didn't have any pollution, so he was able to explain them very clearly and leave them in a condition that other people would be able to benefit from them many years after his death, even today. But because Jesus, and I suggest that Prophet Muhammad most likely wasn't a Buddha and fully enlightened either, their teachings maybe aren't necessarily as clear for some people. But other people might look at those teachings and think that they're very clear and can see a very clear approach of how to get to this ultimate goal that's part of that tradition. So my suggestion is that we look at these commonalities between these various traditions and understand that it's our life progressing gradually and evolving, that moving towards the Buddhist teachings isn't to turn our back on any one particular set of teachings, but instead to move towards something that we feel might be speaking to us more clearly, helping us on this path more clearly, and we're able to see with our own eyes that the condition of the mind is gradually improving. And this can be really helpful. These universal teachings of love, no harm, and good morals, I'm going to explain those to you through the Buddhist teachings. But you might also, depending on your background and other teachings, you might be able to see these same qualities in those teachings. Let me pause here and see what questions you guys have about what I've been discussing so far. The way that you ask questions is put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Our moderators will see that and be sure your question gets asked. You can also raise your hand electronically and ask any questions or follow-up questions that you might have. Hello, teacher. I, um, I was wondering about why, while many teachings from Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad and others have been affected by impermanence, it seems that somehow these three universal teachings are somehow still preserved till today. Yeah, so each one of these teachers, whether it's the Buddha, Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, Hinduism, Judaism, whatever was shared originally, We know that today that what people are seeing isn't the 100% truth because it would be impossible based on the universal truth of impermanence for someone to have taught 1,300 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. Hinduism, I think, goes back even 5,000 years. It would be impossible for someone to teach at any point in time that long ago and for their teachings to be completely untouched and unaffected today. So the universal truth of impermanence has affected all of these teachers' teachings. And this is why Gautama Buddha said that there's going to be a new Buddha in 2,500 years to bring his teachings back into the world in a way that was very clear and vibrant and people could understand them. And then all of the world would get to enlightenment. Jesus Christ talked about him coming back into a new birth and that he essentially was going to share teachings at that point in order to help all of humanity, right? And with Judaism and Muslim teachings, everybody kind of has this idea that there's going to be some being that comes back into the world in order to share teachings that help all of humanity get to this final truth. And then while the Buddha talked about all of humanity becoming enlightened, Jesus Christ talked about creating heaven on earth. I'm not sure about Muslim teachings and others, But there's this kind of theme amongst all these different traditions. And this slow degrading of teachings has led to the degrading of human consciousness, is that if we would have lived during the lifetime of these individuals and we had learned directly from them, then we would have very clear teachings from those individuals of how to live a better life. But those teachings could only be sustained in the world for a certain period of time based on impermanence and because of the condition of the world in terms of travel and language and communication and the way that teaching spread during those time frames there wasn't this international language of english that we have now there wasn't the ease of travel and mobility there wasn't the internet to be able to move teachings around as there are now 
we're in a very unique period of time that any teachings that we can come to in terms of what the Buddha talked about, Maitreya Buddha, Jesus Christ talked about the return of Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad talked about a new individual that was going to come back and share teachings as well, and these other traditions. Nowadays, we have the ability to now speak in a common language across the international world. We have ease of travel for human beings to move around and gain the benefit of these teachings. And we have the internet to be able to share these teachings in a way that didn't exist during the lifetime of these people. But we also know that humanity needs to evolve gradually because just like your mind needs to evolve gradually to enlightenment, like the Buddha talked about, it took him six years to get to enlightenment and even talked about many lives before that, that he was building up to the point of gaining wisdom to actually attain enlightenment. So the human consciousness evolves gradually as an individual, but all of humanity evolves gradually as well. So it would be impossible for just one person to come and teach all of humanity 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago and for everybody to get those teachings. It would require multiple people to come and share teachings that gradually evolve humanity's understanding to the point that ultimately we gain this insight and wisdom that allows us to understand how to evolve as a species and get to this higher consciousness. And now with people being able to see the truth for themselves, they don't need to believe these things, but instead they can observe that the condition of their mind is improving. So this, to me, this teachings of the Buddha, Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad and others is an evolution of our species leading us to where we are today. And if you're learning these teachings with what I share, you're learning teachings that will be able to help you evolve as a human being, getting to this higher consciousness that's not based on belief, but instead you can observe the truth for yourself that as you train the mind, the mind will improve the condition of the mind with discontentedness diminishing. And you'll see that you're making wiser and wiser decisions in your life resulting in a more peaceful and calm, content, and joyful life. So it's just a matter of time that has eroded these teachings, Bassam. And in my opinion, now is the time for us to evolve as a human species. And we can bring these teachings back into the world in a way that all of humanity will be able to access these teachings and then benefit from the work that we do right here, right now. Because all too many people in the world are very interested in changing the world, but how many of us are willing to actually do the work to improve the world? Because if you look at the Buddha's life, Jesus' life, and everyone else that has shared teachings, all of these people worked on themselves first before they ever shared any teachings with anyone else. The Buddha went off into the forest for all those years. You know, Jesus went off into the desert and other people, Prophet Muhammad, I think, went into a cave. All of these people worked on their own mind in their own life for a significant period of time. And as they discovered the teachings that would help humanity, that's when they came back and started sharing the teachings in the world with people that were around and interested in learning. So if you're interested in seeing an improved world and a better world, that all starts with you in your practice, not going out and changing other people because you've got to improve your own life first. And that's where these universal teachings come into play is that if you understand universal love of all beings, do no harm and be a good moral person. If everything else fails in terms of understanding what is right intention, what is right speech, what is right action, what is right effort, you know, all these other teachings that the Buddha shares, and there's plenty that you're going to be learning as part of this program. If for some reason you're in a situation and you just can't access the teachings, you can't reach out to your teacher for guidance, if you can just keep in mind universal love of all beings, do no harm and be a good moral person, and you can make decisions with those three themes in mind, then you're very likely to make wise decisions and ensure that you're not causing harm and that you're making a, a decision that's going to lead to wholesome outcomes. Well, so uh, while one knows that uh, these teachings of those original teachers weren't meant to uh, help people to attain enlightenment, 
but one can still show respect for those original teachers and th these teachings, right? Exactly. That's what I'm suggesting that, you know, the Buddha never said he was a prophet. He never said he was a savior. He never said he was a Lord, even though some people will translate and call the Buddha Lord Buddha. The Buddha himself never called himself any of those things. He never called himself a prophet, savior, messenger, Lord. He never taught rites, rituals, ceremonies, or worship. So if you've been taught in your other traditions to not worship any false prophets or don't worship any false gods or all these other things, in the Buddhist teachings, there is no worship at all. So the Buddha left the door wide open for you to be able to learn his teachings. And because he never called himself a Lord or a Savior or any of these other things, then you can continue to respect Jesus. You can continue to respect Prophet Muhammad and others and appreciate the fact that whatever you learned in the past, has brought you to this point to where you are now, that you're now interested in diving into something unique and something you've never experienced before, you can still have respect and gratitude and appreciation for everything that you've learned in the past and now decide to embark on this next step in your journey of understanding teachings from Professor A from or Professor C, whatever you consider Gautama Buddha to be. You know, you can learn his teachings glean the benefit of those and see the improvement to the condition of the mind and see this as you're evolving as a human being, just like you were maybe in high school or college and you took history from three or four or five different teachers, or you studied English with three, four or five different teachers. And all of these teachers contributed something to your life. You can look at Jesus, Prophet Muhammad and others and the Buddha included as that evolution of learning and that evolution of wisdom and now through stepping in to learn the teachings of the Buddha, it's this next part of your journey to becoming this better human being. Not as a religion, not as commandments, not as rules to follow, nothing like that. The Buddha didn't teach that way. He provided guidance to help you evolve to becoming a better human and living this better way of life. He didn't say that he had discovered a new religion. Even Jesus, you know, he never declare that he had discovered a new religion. You know, Jesus wasn't a Christian. The Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. These were just teachers who were sharing things in the world that were helpful to others. And we can respect all of these people for their contribution to humanity. On Zoom, we have a question from Rick. He writes, what would you say are the main differences between what the Buddha taught and the teachings found in the Hindu yogic traditions? I see a lot of uh, crossover. I know very little about Hinduism. Of course, during the lifetime of the Buddha, what he was exposed to was Hinduism because that's what was being shared in the region of the world that he was in. I know that they teach about gamma or karma. I know they teach meditation as part of that tradition, but I don't know much else about Hinduism. I think there tends to be a good amount of rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship there, which the Buddha knew doesn't lead to enlightenment. So he shared with people that those things don't actually lead to enlightenment. It's through training the mind and gaining this wisdom that actually leads to enlightenment. So while there was teachings about the natural law of gamma and meditation during the lifetime of the Buddha that was coming from Hinduism, it was the Buddha who was able to deeply understand those and then explain it to the people with such clarity that they would understand it and that they would be able to then practice in a way to get the results. Very much like now, we have people all over the world that have all different kind of views and perspectives and opinions about what the natural law of gamma or karma is. We have all kinds of people in the world that do all kinds of different things about meditation. But if you work with a teacher that deeply has practiced the teachings and has experienced the results of enlightenment, then what they're sharing is going to be very clear and very penetrating to help you understand what is the natural law of gamma? What are the meditations that are going to truly help you to improve the condition of the mind? And I suggest that that's what the Buddha did, that while there was all these teachings going on in Hinduism during his lifetime, they weren't deeply understood in the way that the Buddha delivered them and also shared his teachings, which ultimately helped people to understand what he experienced because he experienced this improved mental state of enlightenment or what he called nibbana. 
this improved mental state, he had attained it on his own. So he understood very clearly with deep wisdom of what it took to lead to his own enlightenment. So what a Buddha is actually doing during their lifetime is they're just explaining what led to their own enlightenment. And this is why there's no conflict in a Buddhist teachings that when they teach over their entire lifetime, you won't find any conflict or contradictions in their teachings because they're just looking inward and sharing what they did in order to get to that enlightened mental state. So I suggest that he spoke with this deep clarity because he didn't have the pollution of mind and he spoke in such a way that the local people, while they might have heard the word karma or they might have been exposed to meditation here and there, he was able to explain it in such a level of clarity that people truly got it and then they were able to practice in such a way to experience the results of enlightenment. But in terms of the differences between those traditions, I don't know Hinduism enough to really be able to speak on that. I understand Buddhism and Christianity, but even Muslim teachings, I don't even understand those very much. Well, since that Jen has the hand raised, that's good to hear. Thank you, Basim. Thank you, David. Um, I, I have a question about um, people around me who have uh, doubts about my, I, I tell them occasionally, oh, I'm meditating, I'm studying with a teacher, I am learning about Buddhism. And uh, some members of my family, my extended family, were raised um, to believe that this is putting me on the road to hell <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and damnation, perdition. They're worried about me. They pray for me. They express concern that I'm doing this. And they wish that I would stop. So I just wonder if you have any guidance for you know, I, what I can say to them to reassure them, or I, I generally just, you know, I listen, I don't say much, but if there's any guidance that you have, I'd appreciate hearing it. Sure. Thank you. Sure. So what this is exposing is their craving and attachment to you, that they're very attached to you. And that's why their mind is shaken up to hear that you're doing something else different than them, because their mind is craving permanence and they want everybody to be doing the same thing. This is what the unenlightened mind does. And it gets shaken up when somebody is doing something different than them. And the mind isn't comfortable with just allowing others to make their own decisions. That when we're in the unenlightened state, we try to control others. We try to tell others what's best for them rather than just letting go and allowing that person to do whatever it is that they would like to do. So what this is doing is exposing to you that those people are attached to you. And by you doing your own thing, it's actually helpful for them because eventually they're going to either be highly discontent or they're going to have to let go of their attachment to you in order to get to some level of contentedness. So it's actually really helpful for them. Uh, with that said, there's really nothing that you can say to them that's going to change their mind. The only thing that would change their mind is if they actually learned the teachings themselves, which it doesn't sound like they would, and they can see the truth for themselves that you're actually doing something that's utterly helpful in improving the condition of your mind. So don't feel like you have to say something to them. Don't feel like you have to convince others that you're on the right path. That's what the unenlightened mind wants to do is it feels like we have to make everybody else okay. But we can't do that. The only way that other people can become okay is they have to let go of their attachment. And until the mind is willing to do that, they're going to continue to be discontent because what an enlightened being is going to do is they're going to be just very comfortable with everybody making their own decisions, that they're not going to try to control others or tell others they're headed for bad things. If somebody else is interested in learning Muslim teachings, all right, may you be well, you know, enjoy. Or if you're interested in learning Christianity, all right, great, you know, wonderful. You know, an enlightened being isn't going to crave this permanence for other people to be doing what they're doing. So if I was you, I would do what you're doing, which is pretty much remain quiet. If they ask questions of what you're doing, share that with them politely, kindly, friendly, and respectfully. But just know that the only way for them to truly get to any kind of peacefulness or contentedness is they've got to let go of their attachment to you. And you're not able to do that for them. They have to be able to do it themselves. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. Let's go to Nick for Facebook questions. Thank you, Basim. 
Hello, teacher. There's a similar question to the one that Rick had. Uma writes, good evening, sir. Did Buddha oppose many beliefs in Hinduism or only caste hierarchy in society? I don't think of it as the Buddha opposing anything, although this is the way that some people talk about the Buddhist teachings. They will say he opposed something or he rebuked something or he rejected something. This is how people are choosing to talk about his teachings today because they're in the unenlightened state. But a Buddha in an enlightened being doesn't rebuke something or oppose something or reject anything because a Buddha and a fully perfectly enlightened one, a enlightened being understands that not everybody's going to agree. Not everybody's going to understand their teachings. Not everybody's going to be willing to investigate their teachings during their lifetime. So what I would share is that what was going on during the lifetime of the Buddha in terms of the caste system, which you mentioned, about rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, about people paying Brahmin to pray, and then they thought that that was going to help them in some way. The Buddha didn't necessarily oppose this or rebuke it or reject it or condemn it. Those are all like harsh words that we would use in the unenlightened state, but an enlightened being wouldn't think that way. Instead, when the Buddha taught he taught that those things aren't what leads to enlightenment. That in a caste system where people feel like they're above others or below others, this is dangerous for the mind because now there's arrogance and ego and conceit. So the Buddha taught that all beings are equal. And that's what he taught for his students to cultivate in the mind that you see and you look out in the world as if all beings are equal. Even though other people think differently, that's to their own detriment. But if you're interested in getting to enlightenment, you need to be able to see all beings as equal, even though in the world we have upper class, middle class, lower class, we have impoverished people, we have caste systems, we have royalty, we have all these other things. But your mind needs to develop a practice such that when you interact with people, you look at all beings as equal. Same thing when it comes to rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. The Buddha wasn't opposed to this. He didn't reject it. He didn't condemn it. He didn't have all these strong words that someone might use today to describe his teachings. Instead, he just shared that these things don't lead to enlightenment. That if we sprinkle water on us or we tie a string around our wrist or we put our hands together and we look to the sky and we ask for some intervention from some other being, this isn't what's going to create a better life for ourselves. And a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha and an enlightened being would be able to see this very clearly because you can test it for yourself. You can put your hands together, look up to the sky and ask for anything you want and it's not going to show up. You can sprinkle water on yourself. You can tie strings on your wrist. You can do any kind of rites, rituals, ceremonies and worship that you like. That's not what's going to improve our life. But a Buddha and an enlightened being doesn't look at this as being opposed to those things because whatever other people choose to do in their life, that's their choice. That's what they choose to do. And if they choose to do rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, if they choose to look at people above and below each other, having this conceit and arrogance, that's their choice. But in terms of learning with somebody who's guiding you to enlightenment, what we're going to share with you is that if you're interested to get to enlightenment, you need to understand that rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship isn't what's going to produce wisdom in order for you to make wiser decisions in the world and ultimately train the mind to get to this enlightened mental state. And also looking out at the world as people above and below each other, that's not going to help you cultivate the needed wisdom and understanding of the world around you to treat all beings equally and have loving kindness and compassion for all beings. So I don't think of it as being opposed or rebuking or rejecting or condemning things. But instead, what an enlightened teacher is going to do, what a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha is going to do is just share teachings that is going to help you to understand these things and understand how you can practice in your life to improve the condition of your mind, improve the condition of the mind through acquiring wisdom and making wiser choices in your life so that through your own free will, you see the truth for yourself that these things aren't beneficial in our life. Thanks, sir. No more questions for now. 
Okay, so let me share with you what I consider to be the three universal teachings. These aren't the three universal truths. Those are things that we shared related to the Buddhist teachings. This is teachings that I'm sharing with you to help guide you on this path to enlightenment in case you're looking for this bridge to help you bridge from other traditions into what you're doing now, in case you're looking for this kind of easy way to look at what is the Buddha truly teaching. And if I forget all the other teachings, all the detailed teachings, what is it that I can kind of fall back to in order to make wise decisions in the world? So don't confuse the three universal truths with what I'm sharing here, which are the universal teachings. The universal teachings is what I consider applies to all these different traditions. The three universal truths are the universal truth of impermanence, the universal truth of discontentedness, and the universal truth of non-self. These are specific teachings that you need in order to get to enlightenment. And you would need these teachings here to get to enlightenment too, but this is more of a general perspective to help you understand how to practice in such a way that there's this commonality across traditions. And the first one is universal love of all beings. The Buddha taught this as loving kindness and compassion for all beings. And we're gonna talk about this when we get to chapter 14 in the book. Chapter 14 in the book is talking about the four healthy mental states. They're referred to as the Brahma Viharas. And these Brahma Viharas are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. These are four healthy mental states that you're gonna need in order to get to enlightenment. So we'll talk about those in chapter 14. Be sure that you understand them and be sure you understand how to practice them because these are exact antidotes or remedies to specific difficulties and pollutions that exist in the mind. So for example, anger, hatred, and ill will. Loving kindness is that antidote, that's the remedy. And in the Buddhist teachings, we cultivate this in meditation, and then we practice it in daily life, that we have this active goodwill towards all beings without judgment, that we're not trying to determine or judge who deserves our goodwill, but instead we're not judging other beings. We're just giving our goodwill to all beings regardless, that we have this polite, kind, friendly, and respectful way about us that we interact with others with this politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect. Because when we do that and we treat other people well, then that's what returns back to us. We're not treating other people well because we want this to be returned to us, but just because we know it's wise. Because if we're impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, then we know for sure that's what's going to return back to us. So we need to cultivate this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. This is what's going to help you to cultivate a mind that is interacting in the world with politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect, as well as compassion. Compassion is the concern for the misfortune of others, where on one side of this equation, you might be indifferent and you don't really care about what happens to other people. That's not how an enlightened being is going to function. But on the other side of that, if you're craving for every being in the world to be perfectly safe, perfectly cared for, you're having this mental longing and yearning that anytime you see somebody impoverished or anytime you see someone gets murdered or in a fight or something like this, that your mind just gets so shaken up by it, that's craving desire attachment to have everybody in the world be a certain way. And what you need to move to is not this indifference and not this craving for everyone to have a perfect life, but find this middle where you have compassion, that you understand that as part of this world, that there's going to be beings that are having misfortune, that there's going to be unfortunate things that happen to other people. And there's nothing you can do to immediately affix that for all beings in the world, that every being individually is experiencing the results of their decisions. So if we experience misfortunes, that's because of our own decisions. And you can't fix other people's decisions. 
each person has to choose to acquire wisdom in order to make wiser decisions. So any misfortunes that other people are experiencing, rather than being indifferent and not caring, rather than craving for everyone to be perfect, when we realize that we can't create that for others, they have to create it for themselves. Instead, this middle way is to have compassion, where we have concern for others, and we attempt to allow others to gain the benefit and the help of these teachings. But we do that without craving and without indifference. And I can give you an example of something we're doing with this retreat in the USA where we're not craving for people to come. We're not standing out on the street corner beating a drum, guilting, shaming, and fearing people to come to the retreat. But we're also not indifferent and just like, oh, well, if you would like to come, you've got to pay $2,000 to come to the retreat. You know, we're not doing that either. Instead, we've made this retreat where it's open to everybody. There's no fee to come to the retreat. And we, of course, need donations in order for that to happen. But we're also sending out letters to homeless shelters, to domestic violence centers, and other places, letting them know that this retreat is available for everybody and there's no requirement for anybody to make any payments. So instead of trying to force people to come or rather than being indifferent and not caring whether people come or not, instead we're sending out these letters to just invite people that they're welcome to come and letting them know about this retreat and then they're able to actually participate and come if they choose. There's no expectation, there's no requirement of anything from us, but we're just making this retreat available for people. So that's a way to practice loving kindness and compassion by being in the middle. And then if nobody actually comes from these communities of people who are in unfortunate situations, then that's fine too. But at least we took the effort and the energy to make people aware that this retreat is happening and that they're more than welcome to come without any need to have any kind of financial wealth or anything like that. So finding a way to practice universal love for all beings is going to be unique to you. And I just gave you this one example about this retreat. It doesn't mean that you necessarily go out on the street corner and beat a drum and try to force people to learn and practice these teachings. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you're trying to convince people to practice these teachings. But universal love for all beings and practicing loving kindness and compassion can just be walking down the street and smiling at somebody instead of you know scowling at them or looking down at the ground. It might mean you just smile and wave and say, hi, how are you? Have a wonderful day. That can be loving kindness and compassion for all beings. So sometimes we think that we have to go out and actually change the world. That's not what these teachings are about. Instead, these teachings are about changing your own mind, improving the condition of your own mind. As I mentioned, the Buddha, Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, all these people, all worked on their own mind first before they actually shared any teachings with anybody. So having loving kindness and compassion for beings, practicing this universal love of all beings, is to maintain this interest in seeing all beings be well. And you understand that in order for that to occur, you've got to improve the condition of your own mind. And by you causing less harm in the world, that's your practice of loving kindness and compassion for others which leads us to the next one, which is do no harm. This is a practice of non-ill will or harmlessness. The Buddha talks about this as part of right intention. So as part of right intention, he talks about renunciation or relinquishment or letting go, because in the unenlightened state, there are certain opinions and beliefs and views, perceptions that we have that we're holding on to that is actually keeping the mind in the unenlightened state. So going back to what Uma talked about, you know, during the lifetime of the Buddha, people were holding on to this belief that they had to pay Brahmin and praying on their behalf, they could go home and their life would be better. Well, in order for those people to get to enlightenment, they would have to let go and relinquish or renunciation of that belief because that's not what's going to lead to a better life for them. So part of right intention for the Buddha, he taught renunciation or relinquishment, this willingness to let go essentially keeping an open mind and bringing in some teachings that are going to help you, but also being willing to let go of things that are in your life that you're holding on to really tightly. But more specifically related to do no harm, he taught as part of right intention, non-ill will, which 
non-ill will is the same as saying good will. And having this good will, like the one previous to this, loving kindness, practicing harmlessness, not being interested to harm other beings. Because as long as we have the desire to harm or even the inclination or even the tendency to be sharp with our speech and sarcastic when we talk to other people, as long as we maintain that harmful nature, as long as we maintain even that bit of annoyance and frustration and ill will in the mind, then it's going to come through in our intentions, our speech, and our actions. And as long as we're putting that out to others, that's what's going to come back to us. So in order to practice do no harm, you would need to look at the Buddha's teachings around right intention so that you're practicing non-ill will and harmlessness because all of his teachings center around doing no harm to others because this natural law of gamma of cause and effect or action and result, essentially we experience the results of our decisions that when we cause harm to others, then harm is going to come back to us. So if we walk around with the tendency to be interested to harm others, even with just a little bit of sharp speech every once in a while, that's what's going to come back to us. So we need to purge that from the mind through training the mind and cultivating this loving kindness and compassion so that now we're practicing in a way where we do no harm to others. And that's going to take a gradual progression for you to get there. Because as long as you have craving, anger, and ignorance, or this unknowing of true reality, these three poisons or these three unwholesome roots, as long as they're in the mind, you're going to have a tendency to do things, even without your knowledge, that you're kind of harming others. You know, going back to Jan's question where she was talking about family members that she didn't necessarily say this, but maybe through their speech or trying to control another person of not to do something and holding somebody back from something that they aspire to do. This is harmful when we do these kind of things. It can sabotage our relationships. It can crush our relationships when we're trying to control other beings of what to do and what not to do. Instead, we can ask questions. We can be interested in what other people are doing. We can be thoughtful. We can be inquisitive. We can ask these questions. But once we start telling other people what they should do in their life, that's where we're now in conflict and we can sabotage our relationships. We should only be sharing with people teachings to improve their life if they ask for our advice. If they come to a class or if they ask us for advice, then we can share something with them to help them. But when we're pushing our perceptions and our opinions and our views on other people, that's just the mind having craving and trying to get other people to do things our way. So there's all these aspects of this path to enlightenment that the Buddha shares with us about how to ensure we're not causing harm to other beings. And this is what we also see in other teachings. You know, like I mentioned, Jesus, Prophet Muhammad and others, there's this aspect of not harming other beings. But to me, the Buddha just explained it so clear and so concise as part of right intention and part of all of his other teachings. And then the last thing that I'll share with you today is this third universal teaching, which is be a good moral person. In the Buddhist teachings, he taught this as part of the Eightfold Path, as part of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. I taught those things in prior classes. That's where he shares the moral conduct. Because as long as we go out into the world and we're using wrong speech or wrong action or wrong livelihood, and you're trying to get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, if you're not practicing this good, wholesome moral conduct, then the more harm you're putting out into the world through your moral conduct, that's just going to come back to you. When the Buddha would have a new student start with him, one of the first things that he would teach them is to improve their moral conduct. So he would teach them to improve their speech through right speech, like not lying and not gossiping, not slandering, not having harsh speech, not having frivolous speech. He would teach right action in terms of not killing and not stealing and not having sexual misconduct. And he taught about right livelihood, about not harming through the way that we sustain our life and the choices we make about our career and the way that we acquire money and the way that we use that money in our life, this livelihood that we have 
if we're doing things like selling weapons, if we're selling living beings, if we're selling meat, if we're selling intoxicants, if we're selling poisons, these things are all going to cause harm in the world. So the Buddha helped his students to understand how to improve their moral conduct, because while you're working on meditation and all the other steps of the Eightfold Path, you would like to ensure that you're improving your moral conduct and the way that you're interacting in the world. Because you could be over here meditating and doing all this great work meditating on your own. But if you go out into the world and you're speaking in ways or your actions are a certain way, or your livelihood's a certain way, you're causing harm. It doesn't matter how much meditation you're doing on your own, that harm that you're causing in the world through your speech, your actions, and your livelihood, it's all going to keep coming back to you. So you can't meditate your way to enlightenment. Yes, meditation is an important part of that, but you need to improve your moral conduct and the way that you interact with other beings in the world. Because as long as you're causing harm to others, they're going to be interested in harming you. So by you improving your moral conduct, you will see that over a gradual period of time, you won't have people that are interested in harming you because you're not harming any other beings. So these are the three universal teachings. Universal love of all beings, meaning loving all beings universally without any judgment, treating all beings with this love and kindness and compassion, being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to all beings, ensuring that you're not causing harm, setting the right intention or the right thought of non-ill will and harmlessness, not being interested in being harmful, but instead practicing harmlessness, because you understand that if you cause harm, harm's going to come back to you. And then improving your moral conduct in the way that you communicate with others through speech and Facebook posts, social media posts, emails, chats, text messages, things like this. Ensuring that your bodily actions aren't harmful to others and ensuring that whatever livelihood you practice is a wholesome livelihood, that it's helping and beneficial to humanity, that it's not causing harm to others. And these are things that you can always revert back to as a high level understanding. If you can't remember the detailed teachings of the Eightfold Path, this is there to help support you. And it's also there to help you see this bridge that these are essentially what grandma, grandpa was teaching you, what mom and dad was probably teaching you, depending on what kind of family you grew up in. If you studied Christian teachings, Hindu teachings, Muslim teachings, Judaism, or any others, you would have been learning things along this topics, along these topics. These are kind of the things that are being taught in those traditions, but they're being described in different ways that may or may not have connected with you. And perhaps it's the Buddhist teachings that really connect with you and help you to see the clarity of how you can improve your life practice and now make wiser decisions in the way that you interact in the world. So this is everything that I was going to share with you guys today on this chapter. But if you've read this chapter and you have questions or you have any questions on anything that I just shared, you can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like because it's important for you to get clarity on these teachings so that you can understand how to implement them into your life. So I'll open up to any questions that you guys might have. Well, as for do no harm, does this also include not causing harm for ourselves? I mean, uh, this body and this mind? Yes, definitely. So when we talk about loving kindness and compassion for all beings and doing no harm, this relates to you as well, because oftentimes we go out in the world and we just pour ourselves into other beings and we leave ourselves depleted. Some people teach that it's selfish to take care of yourself, that you should put all this effort and energy into helping others. And essentially what ends up happening is people neglect their own well-being. But that's not going to work for you. And it hasn't worked for you because if you've been doing that, you know that it leaves you depleted. So it's not selfish to put yourself first. We're not putting ourselves first in a conceited way. We're putting ourselves first in terms of we realize that in order for us to be good for others, we need to be good to ourselves first. So whether it's certain foods, whether it's 
taking care of this physical body or anything else that you need to do in order to take care of this being, you need to take care of this being first, because if you don't, then you're not going to be existing in this world to be able to then potentially help family or friends or other people that might need your help. So you need to be sure that you're making wise decisions about food that you're putting into the body, about certain financial decisions, about how you spend your time, with who you spend time with, with what type of activities you're involved in and all these other things, because there's this cause and effect relationship that based on the decisions that you make, you're going to experience the results of this. Your life isn't predetermined. There isn't some being controlling you that's forcing you to do any one particular thing or another. Everything that you experience in this life is as a result of your decisions. So when you make wise, wholesome decisions, you'll experience wholesome results. And part of those wise decisions are improving the condition of the mind, making sure that you're training the mind regularly, but also that you're caring for this physical body as well. Because if you don't care for the physical body and it dies, it can no longer sustain life, then the mind and the body are going to separate and you're no longer able to train the mind. So you need to look at these two things as being separate. The body and the mind are two separate things and you need to care for them. There's certain tasks that we do on a day-to-day basis to care for the body and care for the mind. There's a quite significant amount of time that we spend cutting our hair, brushing our teeth, grooming any kind of facial hair, maybe putting on lotion, maybe taking a shower, caring for certain clothing, ensuring that we have clothing, eating. And when we eat, we have to shop and prepare food and wash dishes, care for our house. There's all this effort around sustaining this physical body. And we also need to apply certain effort to improving the condition of the mind. And all of this is working to create a better existence in this particular life. But this is also why once you get to enlightenment, you're no longer going to experience the burden of having to carry around this physical body. Because while we're in this human state and we need to care for the body, you can see how much work it is to carry around these bones and the skin and this fluid. There's just an enormous amount of work that we put into caring for this body, which we need to do in this life. But if you get to enlightenment and you're no longer experiencing rebirth, then you'll have been able to lay down that burden of no longer needing to experience future existences and continuing to have to put in all this effort and time to care for this physical body that we're essentially carrying around. Do you consider hurting other people's feelings is a kind of causing harm to them? It's interesting that you ask that question because the only way that somebody's feelings can get hurt is if they have craving, desire, attachment. They are causing their own feelings. But we can certainly do things that causes harm to others. But in terms of their discontentedness, they're causing their own discontentedness. But if we spoke harsh to somebody, and of course they're unenlightened, they're going to have discontentedness. If you spoke harsh to an enlightened being, they're not going to have any kind of feelings at all. But there's very few enlightened beings in the world right now. We're working to improve that, but there's very few. So if you speak harsh to somebody, you can think of that as you causing harm to that person. But when they get discontent, their discontentedness is being caused by their own craving, desire, attachment. But knowing that, it doesn't mean that you have a green light to go around and speak harsh to people. Because if you speak harsh to people, people are going to speak harshly back to you. So it's a matter of harm versus discontentedness. You can't cause somebody else discontentedness, but you can cause somebody harm. If you stole somebody's car, that would cause them harm because they wouldn't be able to get to work. They wouldn't be able to provide for their family. They would go through a period of time where they wouldn't be able to acquire the the goods and services and resources that they need to sustain their life. So we can cause harm to others through our intentions, our speech, our actions, our livelihood, and things like this. But we can't cause discontentedness. Other people are causing their own discontentedness. But we can create conditions in which people will get discontent. So if we speak harsh and someone gets discontent, they're causing their own discontentedness. But we created the situation in which 
their mind is now getting discontent. So we didn't cause their discontentedness, but we did something that precipitated it. And what the Buddha is teaching you as part of this path to enlightenment is not only how to get rid of your own discontentedness, but he's also helping you to be able to function in the world that beings are less likely to get discontent around you because you're functioning in a way that doesn't give others the opportunity to become discontent. Because if you're practicing all the steps of the Eightfold Path, then what you'll find is there'll be very few people who will become discontent around you because you're speaking to them in wholesome ways. You're not harming them through your bodily actions. You're not harming them through your livelihood and all the other teachings that the Buddha teaches. So it's important to understand the difference between harm and discontentedness. These are two different things. And it's important to understand that as you clear out the pollution of your mind, you're not going to be creating situations where it provides the opportunity for someone's mind to become discontent. But even as an enlightened being, there will be the occasional person that will become discontent around you. And it's not because you harm them, but because of their own cravings, desire, attachments. Well, talking about a harsh speech, uh, for some people, they think that uh, talking in a harsh way is the only way to end the situation. I mean, if, what, if a parent is talking to their children in some situations, some parents think that the only way to end the situation is to shout at that child. Do you agree with this? I don't agree with it because they're not seeing the bigger picture. That shouting at the child might scare the child or put them in fear that they stop doing what they're doing right now at that particular moment. But shouting at the child hasn't given them any wisdom in which to improve their decision making so that they no longer do those things. Instead, if a parent has wisdom themselves and if they're patient themselves, then instead of shouting, they understand what the problem is, is that the child lacks wisdom. And then we can patiently sit down and guide our children to make better decisions. And that's what solves the problem long term. If you shout at a child and you put fear in them, like an animal, you're just raw. And then the, the younger animal, the less dominant animal, the child submits to your growl. You might have solved that in terms of they're no longer doing that in that immediate time and space. But as they go forward in life, they still haven't learned the wisdom. So they're going to be repeating the thing that you growled at them about. And as they age, what you've taught them is that when somebody does something you don't like, you yell and you shout at them. So now as they age, they're going to be yelling and shouting at other people and they're going to be yelling and shouting at you because you've conditioned their mind that when somebody does something you dislike to yell and shout at them. So now as you age and your children start taking care of you, when you do things that they don't like, they're going to start yelling and shouting at you. And this is your gamma coming back to you. This is the results of your decision. So someone who's impatient, who has craving anger and ignorance themselves, who lacks wisdom, in that moment, they might think the shouting in the harshness is solving the problem, but it's actually making the problem worse because now that problem that the child was doing is going to just continue and they're going to start shouting and yelling at you as they go forward in life and they're going to shout and yell at other people and find themselves in all kinds of difficult situations as they grow up. What if one started to practice in a moral way but uh, others are still uh, practicing, uh, still not practicing a moral conduct uh, towards us? So that's exactly what an enlightened being is going to evolve beyond. If you think about a lotus flower and how a lotus flower is down in the murky water of a pond and it has to grow through the murky water and rise up above the murky water and then it blooms into this really beautiful bloom of a lotus flower, that's essentially what an enlightened being is doing is rising above the murkiness of the water. It's rising above this murkiness of the world, that the world is involved in all kinds of unwholesome conduct and all kinds of unwholesome decisions. And as long as you continue to function like that, then you're going to stay in that murkiness and have all kinds of difficulties in your life. 
But as an enlightened being and somebody who's looking to gain wisdom, if you're looking to rise above this, even if other people are unwholesome in their conduct and the way that they function, you need to rise above that, not in a conceited way or an arrogant way, but just realize that while others may choose to function in that way, you're going to choose not to function in that way. And then that's where you get to make choices in your life about who to associate with. You can choose who are your friends and who are your colleagues and who are the people you choose to interact with on a regular basis. The Buddha taught about having wholesome friends and wholesome companions as part of your path to enlightenment. That is, if you're around a bunch of unwholesome influences, your mind's going to have a tendency to move towards that. So no matter what other people are doing in the world, you need to see it as your path to enlightenment is to rise above that. So while other people may speak harsh, you choose to speak gentle. While other people might choose to lie, you're going to choose to tell the truth. While other people may choose to have frivolous speech and idle chatter, you're choosing to have beneficial and purposeful speech. While other people might choose to be hateful and vindictive and resentful and jealous, you're choosing not to do those things. And you're getting the wisdom from the Buddhist teachings of how to do that through training the mind. But if you just stay mired in the muddy water with everyone else, this lotus flower can't come up out of the murky water and bloom into a beautiful lotus flower because it's stuck in the murky water with everybody else. On Zoom, we have a question from Alaxo. When we do meta med meditation, should our meta radiate out in all directions, which naturally encompasses all sentient beings? So your loving kindness meditation is all about transforming your own mind. Oftentimes people think that loving kindness meditation is to change other people. And it's impossible for you to change other people through your meditation. If that was possible, there would be no such thing as prisons or murders or rapes or any of these other things because people like us could sit down and meditate and change everybody else. It's not possible for us to do that. Instead, you need to cultivate loving kindness in your mind for beings that you are around, that you have loving kindness for. You need to continue to cultivate it for them. For people who you're more neutral about, you need to cultivate it for them. And people that you have anger and hatred for in your own mind, you need to cultivate this loving kindness for them. Not that you're trying to change them, but you're trying to change your mind so that you eradicate the anger, hatred, and ill will from your own mind by moving in this loving kindness. And then when you move in this loving kindness into your mind, now when you interact with other beings through your intention, speech, and actions, you're doing that through loving kindness and emanating loving kindness from your own intention, speech, and actions. So I don't think about it as radiating loving kindness in all directions because you need to ultimately cultivate loving kindness for all beings in the world so that there's no being that you don't interact with without loving kindness that every single being you interact with you have this genuine interest in seeing them be well and it's all about your practice so if you would like to think about it as radiating loving kindness out towards all sentient beings, then that's up to you. You can think of it that way. But more importantly, what you're doing is you're moving loving kindness into the mind and moving out this anger, hatred, ill will, and even those lesser versions like frustration, irritation, and annoyance. You're trying to move all of that out so that now there's this uprooting of anger, hatred, ill will, and you're now putting in this loving kindness. So now in your intention, speech, and actions, you can be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful with all beings. Because as long as you maintain any kind of anger, hatred, or ill will towards any beings, then you're going to be putting that out and that's what's going to come back to you. So it's more about cultivating your own mind to eliminate any kind of anger, hatred, and ill will. Many thanks, teacher. Seems that this is all what, that we have for today. All right. Well, this was just a really short chapter for you guys to start understanding how these teachings can be a bridge for you to move from whatever you've learned so far towards the Buddhist teachings and 
understanding that you can completely do that without any kind of feelings of guilt or shame or fear that you're going to end up in some horrible place at the end of this life and that you're going to end up in a very difficult situation at some point because while other people around you may not understand what you're doing and that's very common because they don't understand these teachings while they don't understand necessarily what you're doing as long as you understand what you're doing that's what's important we have to train the mind to let go of wanting everybody to agree with us that's not possible it's not possible for everyone to agree with what we're doing that would be permanence. So by us understanding that there's going to be people who agree with what we're doing and there's going to be people who disagree with what we're doing. And our goal in this life isn't to get everyone to agree with what we're doing. Our goal in this life is to understand the wisdom of these teachings through independent verification so that as you're gaining that wisdom, you know the truth and you know where you're headed. You know that the guidance you're receiving, you know the teachings that you're practicing are improving the condition of the mind, and you can see the truth for yourself that that's occurring. If other people aren't aware of that, or they don't take the time to understand that, that's on them. So as long as you understand that you're walking towards the light, which is what the Buddha talked about, which is what others talked about, you're walking towards this more wholesome way of being, and there's going to be other people who disagree with you. There was people who disagreed with the Buddha. There was people who disagreed with Jesus. There was people who disagreed with Prophet Muhammad and others. There were people that hated the Buddha. There was people that hated Jesus Christ. There was people that hated Prophet Muhammad. There's people today that hate all of these people, right? But that's their problem because they have hate in their mind. So when you are interacting with others and they may not understand what you're doing, just use that as a way for you to let go of craving for everyone to understand what it is you're doing and craving for everyone to agree with you. The only one that has to agree with you is you. You're the only one that has to agree with you. You're making your own decisions in this life. And when you understand these universal teachings of universal love for all beings, do no harm and be a good moral person, then you can understand that all these teachings are essentially leading to the same place. And it's important for you to find a teacher and a professor that can really speak to you. And for me, it's Gautama Buddha. He's the one who really says it's super clear. But these other teachers have things that can help us to understand that everybody's being kind of pointed to this better way of life and we can respect and have appreciation and gratitude for all these other teachers without a need to say who's right and who's wrong or to fight or bicker over who's right and who's wrong what's right is when you observe the condition of your mind gradually improving through training your mind then you know that you're on the right path and that's all the confirmation that you need that things in your life are getting better and things are improving. You don't need other people to validate your decisions. That's not something that you need. You just need to be sure yourself. If you're looking for others to validate your decisions, then you're still having attachment to other people. Instead, you need to understand that an enlightened being is going to be a person who's making wise decisions for their own life. They're not a follower. There's someone who's an independent practitioner who's receiving guidance and support from a particular teacher or particular teachings, but a enlightened being isn't going to follow other beings because that lotus flower that blooms out of the murky water, it's got to know how to get above the murky water itself. There's nobody else that's controlling that lotus flower. That lotus flower is doing that on their own. So you'll have to be a practitioner who's independently verifying the truth and looking to practice universal love, doing no harm, and be a good moral person. In our next class on Sunday, we're going to be in chapter two, which is titled, Why Study Gautama Buddha's Teachings? You'll see my thoughts on that chapter there. And then when we do our class, we're actually going to do something unique. We're going to have an interactive discussion about why have you chosen 
to study the teachings of Gautama Buddha because you'll see my thoughts in chapter two about why I feel that it's important for a practitioner to study the teachings of Gautama Buddha. So you can glean my understanding from the book. So when we come to class next Sunday, rather than me teaching you what is already in the book, I'm going to be interested in why have you chosen to actually study the teachings of the Buddha? Because now we're about six weeks at that point in this program, and it'll be a great time for all of you guys to interact and talk with each other. And you'll see how we'll have a nice interactive discussion. So those of you guys that are in Facebook or YouTube, or you're typically listening to the replay or on the podcast, if you would like to come into Zoom next Sunday, then we can have this really nice interactive discussion and get to know each other a bit more now that we're embarking on this journey to learning the teachings of the Buddha. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be doing that first class of our loving kindness meditation series. We're doing a four-part series where I'm going to build you guys up with loving kindness meditation so that you can start moving out this anger, hatred, and ill will and move in the loving kindness. So thank you all for joining for today's class. I'll see you either next Sunday or perhaps Wednesday, maybe both of those days. Be sure that you continue to meditate and you read the book, and I'll see you in a future class. Have a very lovely rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.